power. And that's interesting because um, about nine months ago, I just thought to myself, you know, these Freemasons, they've said in the past that they're not going to openly disclose their, um, their membership. Although now in the police force, they do have to declare that they're a Freemason on the forms when they're in the job. Um, so politicians have, say, have stated in the past they feel no obligation to do this. And Tony Blair actually made a decision. He said, well, actually, no, we won't you know, sort of make them do it. And I'm thinking, well, you know, who's putting pressure on you, Tony? Because if you weren't a Freemason, um, then you wouldn't be so worried about this, I'm sure. But who's putting pressure on you? So I thought, well, OK, let's find out. So I wrote off, and to Tony Blair had actually handed over to Gordon Brown, uh, wrote a letter just saying, simply, is Gordon Brown a Freemason, number 10? Thank you very much, Matthew Williams' address. Never got a reply. Now, this is unusual because normally you get an acknowledgement letter from um, number 10 to say that they're at least looking at the letter. Now, they didn't come back to me, so I got Michael Ancrum, the local MP, and I got him to send a letter on my behalf. And at this time, I got an acknowledgement. But this was three and a half months ago. It seems a long time to get a response to a one-line question, which just is, needs yes, no answer. It's an awfully long time. So I've just got back in touch with Mike Lancrum at the moment. And I think that there's a general worry that um, exposure of who are Freemasons is going to cause a problem for the government. Now, I'm quite happy for that to happen because I want the Freemasons to be exposed. I think that they should identify their you know, allegiances um, in organizations in the same way as you'd say, well, I have a business interest. You know, I have a business interest, so therefore, you know, maybe I should or shouldn't be making contributions towards the government and how much should I be contributing? And, you know, if you've got cross-party uh, pollination of Freemasons' ideas, this is one, one possible explanation for why it doesn't really matter who you get in power, but the ideas and policies will always stay the same. Um, the Freemasons and the Illuminati as, uh, that, are, that are above them, um, they really do run the planet. And it's through the banking systems and then down through um, lower business and through secret societies. And it's quite clear that these people set the stage for what's going to happen, and then they decide how the money is going to be manipulated, who's going to be in positions of power, who are going to be the puppet leaders. And these are usually people who have got connections to the secret societies, and we'll come back to this in, in a little bit. And they actually manipulate world events. And this is why I think it's important that these people should come out and say, well, I do have these connections. So far, there is a resistance in the British political system to actually make this admission. And why would that be? If you've got nothing to hide, as the police say, or with security cameras on the streets, if you've got nothing to hide, you shouldn't mind us looking into your business. So I think the reverse is also true. And we as the public um, should be looking at their business and actually making it our business to find out what they're up to. Because as we know, with the expenses, scandals, and various other things, politicians do need to be watched. They're interesting people at the best of times. So um, hopefully we get an answer. Now, this is Cecil Rhodes. Um, I'm just going to, uh, I'm just going to talk about him for a second, because he's uh, a guy that is supposed to have um, created Rhodesia. Now, talk about an ego. Um, you know, let's call a country after myself. You know, it's like you get in a place, and the next thing you know, it's not called Britain anymore. It's called Matthewville, or United United England of Williamson, or something. You know, it's like it's it's crazy. This guy, who's a businessman, Freemason, um, of course, has high moral values. Decides, and this is just one example from this man's life, that what he would do is he would buy up the mineral rights of the countries he was um, going into and controlling. And he, w he sent out um, various agents to speak to the tribal leaders to buy up the mineral rights. And some of them said, we're not interested in this. This doesn't work for us. You know, this is not a good deal. And we don't like it. So what he did is he would send back his agents. He would say, well, what sort of deal do you want then? And he, they'd go, well, we'd like this and we'd like this. OK, he'd write up the deal. There you go. There's the deal. And they couldn't read properly, so they would sign it, 
And the deal didn't say anything about what was being verbally put forward. So actually, they were told, in one um, case, Francis Thompson, who tra traveled to Bulawayo in the ch company of Charles Rudd and uh, Rock Rockford Maguire, assured leader of a village, uh, Lobangula, that no more than 10 white men would m mine in a mine at um, Matabeli land. So he thought, well, it's not going to damage my environment. It's not going to take too much minerals because it's only going to be 10 men. And then uh, he basically reneged on this because in the contract, nothing was stated about how many men would work there, although it had been verbally agreed 10 men would. So if this man is a Freemason, and we all know how businesses are quite cutthroat and corporate entities tend to sort of work to their own interest, not necessarily your interest or the greater interest, but for, simply for their own interests, then when you have a Freemason who claims to, you know, be part of an organization that holds to such high values and behaves like this, you have to question, you know, what exactly are their agendas? Is it personal? Um, can they be trusted? Anyway, um, Rhodes, Cecil Rhodes Mor uh, Memorial stands on his favorite spot, which is called Devil's Peak in Cape Town. I mean, I don't know uh, what you'll think by the end of this talk, but uh, that might play as being a, a, an interesting place to have yourself buried. But um, he started an organization called the Rhodes Scholars Institute, and this would give money to uh, up-and-coming scholars to attend universities. Now, some of the, um, well, I'd say most of the people, most of the names of these people that have attended Rhodes Scholars um, uh, scholarships, uh, all of these people have become very high-powered leaders of the world. And you've got names like uh, Bill Clinton, John Kerry, George Bush. We'll come back to those names in, in a minute. And, um, sorry. What we're going to have a look here is the principles that the Freemasons say they adhere to. And what we've got at the top is brotherly love. That every true Freemason will, will show tolerance and respect for the opinions of others and behave with kindness and understanding to fellow creatures. Well, that may be what they say. Actions uh, speak louder than words. Relief. The Freemasons are taught to practice charity and to care, not only for their own, but for their community as a whole, both by charitable giving and voluntary efforts for works and works as individuals. And they're interested in the truth. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip on to um, these guys. Uh, I don't know if, if it would be better to put a photo up of a bunch of clowns, actually. I mean, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not somebody who gets impressed by all this sort of regalia business and um, ego, ego massage that um, the Freemasons uh, involve themselves in. Um, I think that uh, if you get a bunch of guys together who just pat each other on the back all day long and call each other worshipful master and um, grand mason and uh, most worshipful grand mason, you know, why exactly are these people so worshipful and grand? What makes them worshipful and grand? Is it really their actions, or is it the fact that they call themselves worshipful and grand? It's going back, like going back to the, the doctors and professors. It's like, you know, let's give myself a title. Sounds really good. Everybody thinks I should be worshipped, and I'm grand. It means nothing. You know, it means absolutely nothing. So, um, the work of charity is a very interesting thing that um, starts to show some of the hypocrisy of the Freemasons. And what you have is... A lot of the Freemasons will make these statements about, you know, we're interested in charity, just like a lo local golf club and things like this. And what they say is that um, from its earliest days, Freemasonry has been concerned with the care of orphans, the sick and the aged. This work continues today. In addition, large sums are given to national and local charities. And the Masonic charity is exercised at every level. Individual lo lodges make gifts and give aid to their own communities. And every province, province sorry, also gives large sums of money to regional causes. Nationally, our efforts are channeled through four main charity organizations. And these are the Grand Charity, the Royal Masonic Trust for Girls and Boys, the Royal Masonic Benevolent Institution, and the Masonic Samaritan Fund. Now, I've spoken to Freemasons, and I've, I've 